Let me get started here. Hello, hello. Happy Tuesday. Hi, yes, turn on your cameras. Turn on your cameras, please. I like to see you guys. <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? Hi, good. <laughs> Hi, Heather. Hi. Thank you guys for being on. Uh, thank you, Marissa. I was just getting ready to say, um, just I'm hoping it's not going to happen, but if I have like a cough attack, you guys are just going to have to bear with me. But I've got like all the all the water and all the drinks around me right now and a cough drop. <clears throat> so I don't have COVID just in case anybody's wondering, but oh, I have been a, little, been a little under the weather. I don't know what it is, but I just told Abby, it's not even like, it's like the annoying sick where you don't feel like death, but you just are annoyed that you have it. You know what I mean? Yes, that's, that's how it is. I'm like, just go away so I can go back to my life. Um, thank you guys so much for being on. Let's see, we are recording. Awesome. More people are hopping on too. Um, I have really enjoyed doing these industry updates every month and I would love feedback from you guys too. Anything that you would like to learn about that I'm not talking about, um, any questions that you have, just anything really about that, because I am very passionate about this. And let me get to where I can get my screen started here. Um, and I, I believe that I believe that sometimes we get so busy in our business <laughs> that we don't take time to actually understand what's happening inside the industry. And I think that I'm actually going to share a start a story with you guys that will give you some some um hopefully give you a little perspective around it. Um, but I just, I think we just really, really have to be aware um, and, and understand what's happening in the market. And again, it's not from a scarcity perspective. And I think today you'll really see that, but I borrowed a lot of what I'm talking about today from several uh, different sources. And so I always want to cite those sources. And a lot of it also came from Dave Ramsey. Megan, I know you were on there. So some of it you'll see again, um, but we'll try to go deeper into it. Um, but I definitely want to make sure that you guys know that I didn't come up with that. And I'm, and I'm for sure not trying to get sued by Dave Ramsey. <laughs> So all the, I think he would win that one. So all the, all the credit goes to him for some of these slides. Um, if you missed, oh shoot, Abby, I forgot to ask you this ahead of time, but um, will you put the link to the, to the one team YouTube in the chat, pretty please. If you missed um, session one, <clears throat> session two or session three, you can go back and watch those. They're all on the YouTube and if you missed any of them, I would definitely go back because you're going to find some relevant information in all of those. Um, and I, I've been starting with a couple of the same things every time that I want to continue to really quickly. You are here today um, to make you the local economist because your clients deserve your knowledge. Um, you don't want to be one of the ones who waits until it's in your face and then prepare. You want to be proactive, not reactive, because that's how all successful individuals are. Um, and, and I really want to give you perspective because <clears throat> knowledge is power. Um, thank you, Abby. And the more that you have perspective, um, the more that you can understand this. And I, Stephanie, I love Stephanie said I did not win the last shift, but this one will be different. I love it. Good affirmation. That's a great affirmation, by the way. Um, and that walks right into <clears throat> one of my favorite quotes by Gary Keller, which is the market share that you lose in a shift, you will never get back with the market share that you gain in a shift, you will never lose. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to give you perspective. <laughs> and um, I, I copied this from Dave Ramsey, only I found my own picture because um, two years ago, three years ago, I can't remember when it was a couple years ago, um, I got invited to go fish um, with some ladies. Uh, Linda McKissick invited me in West Virginia at the or close to the Greenbrier on some land that Gary Keller owns. Um, he's a, he's crazy about fishing and he's but he bought this area and he developed it and it's just awesome. And Dave used this as an example. And I thought I have my own example to you to give to you guys. And it's the example of a big picture of a fish. And when people catch these fish, they hold them up to the camera and you can see you're supposed to, I didn't do a very good job of this. You're supposed to hide your fingers a little bit underneath of it. And you put them way out so that they're right up in the camera so that the fish appears to be much larger <laughs> than what it actually is in real life. And um, while I would love to tell you that I caught like a big one, I think this was like a mediocre something or another. However, it's all about perspective because perspective actually gives you hope and perspective 
shouldn't come from the things that sometimes it does come from, which is Facebook or what we hear our friends say or other people around our office, but it should come from data. It should come from real experiences. And you can also use the past as a predictor to give you really great perspective. So today I want to share with you guys some really great perspective um, and, and with the intention of you walking away feeling like, okay, this is, this is good. Like I don't, I don't, I understand it and I have perspective on it and I don't have to live in like a, a freak out thing. Um, I, I like to start with the new millionaire real estate triangle. This has evolved so much. I know, I know several of you aren't with Keller Williams and that's totally cool. Um, if you haven't read the MREA, then you may not know about this, but many of you, when you hear of the triangle of real estate, you think of leads, listings, and leverage, which are the bottom squares. You, it, it all starts with leads. Um, when you get your real estate license, you got to get leads. If you don't have leads, you don't have a business. And then it moves to listings because you navigate more towards, okay, now I know that he who has the listings is the one that's going to dominate and listings bring buyers. And then you get to a point in your business where you have to start bringing in leverage um, because only one person can only do so much alone, right? So then um, this was this triangle evolved and, and it, we went to the inside and Gary said, okay, um, in order for that to happen, in order for you to be a millionaire real estate agent, you have to first think it because if you don't believe it and you don't think it uh, with your mindset, then it's never going to happen. So if you don't think that you can do it, then you're not, you're not going to probably do it. It's our self-talk. That's really, really bad. Um, and then after you think it, you move to earn it. And that's when you actually start to just gross as much as you possibly can. So if any of you are drawing this out and writing that down, which I would encourage you to do, because remember you retain, I think it's 65% more when you actually write something down. Um, <clears throat> but um, when you earn it, what I would write next to that is just gross as much as you can. Um, and you get into just being able to, to gross as much as you possibly can. Then you move into net. And that's where you really start to run a PL. You understand your expenses and you understand how much you're bringing home versus how much you're spending. And you not only just earn it at that point, you, you net it at that point also. And then you move to receive it. Receive it really next to that, you should write passive. Um, and what Gary means by this part of the triangle, receive it, <clears throat> is you should really start to think about growing your passive income and other streams of income. So you're already netting something from your real estate business at this point. And then how can you start to receive some passive income streams, whether it's other opportunities, whether it's through your profit share, whether it's, um, if you're with KW, if, if you're not, maybe it's through rentals or, you know, uh, investment properties, what, whatever that looks like, but you start to think about passive. And then at the top, it's how can you strategically give it? And so that's when you think about, okay, man, now I can really give. The third layer of this um, was just added really about a year ago. And I think this part could prove to soon be the most important part. And that's the bottom, meaning it all um, starts with your value proposition. So you have to truly know this, this is, this, um, it doesn't matter what kind of industry or market we're in, you have to have a value proposition. When we enter into a shift or what I'm now liking to call a, um, let me tell you the exact word, a D, Deceler, de, uh, deceleration, I think is the word I had of the market. I've got it in here somewhere. Um, <clears throat> you, you have to know your value prop. You have to really understand the value that you provide to your clients. And then you move over to customer experience. And this is not just do they receive good service from you? This is what experience do you give them? And we've talked a little bit about this before, but just to give you some examples, I mean, like, do you know, I think about the shift interview that we did with, um, I did with Linda McKissick and Terry Morler last week. Like, do you know so much about your clients and their kids that you are actively sending them, you know, cards, um, gas cards when their kid turns 16 and gets their driver's license? Um, are you giving them a great experience that when they show up to look at houses, you've got coloring books and crayons of houses uh, for their kids to keep them occupied. You know that when they're moving, when the movers are coming, are you having pizzas delivered for their move? Like what experience are you really giving them? Because that's, that's definitely what it's more about. And then the third part of that is your database or data bank, or what Gary would also refer to as now your community. And it's being so intentional with them. Um, very, very intentional. Oh, Stephanie, that's awesome. 
Yeah, you are in great relationship with your people. Absolutely. And that's the way that it should be. Um, you know, you're doing something right when you're getting invited to your to their weddings and their <laughs> in their events and those sorts of things. So I want to share with you um, two quotes I shared last time. Uh, Wayne Gretzky says, I skate to where the puck is going, um, not where it has been. And I want you to think about that as we go into a shifting market. And then also change is inevitable, but per and participation is not. Um, and what that change is, is not inevitable. What the change is belongs to those who create it. So you should go and be the puck. And I'm, I'm actually being a guest on the podcast this afternoon for a really good friend of mine, Tyler Dickerhoof. Um, he's been on Wednesday Morning Mindset several times. So some of you may know him, but he has an awesome leadership podcast. And he asked me to come on at 3.30 today and talk about real estate and the changing, um, the changes in the industry and how to be a leader during those changes. And one of the first things that popped into my mind is about two years ago when we were opening an office in Ashland, Kentucky, and um, some of you that might be on might have been there with me that day, but we went to look at space and the first space that we looked at for our office, we pulled up to, and it was a blockbuster building. I actually have pictures of it somewhere here on my computer. And it still was like a actual, like they just picked up and left. I mean, the blockbuster sign was still outside. Um, they still had like the upcoming feature of the movie of the week, which I, which I still remember was Big Mama's house. It was like posters everywhere when you walked into blockbuster and they still had like some um, movies on the shelves and all that stuff. And I instantly felt two things. Like one, I felt a little bit of like nostalgia because I was like, man, remember when we used to, it used to be like a thing to go to Blockbuster and you picked out your candy and you went through and looked at the new releases and all that stuff. And then the second part of me felt kind of sad. You know, I was like, man, it's crazy because it was just like one day you were like, we opened our eyes and all the Blockbusters were gone. Um, and then the, the, the next part of me felt like, but how much do I love Netflix? Like, I love it. I love, <laughs> I love that Netflix tells me what I want to watch before I even know what I want to watch. Um, I love that I don't have to watch, you know, I don't have to uh, worry about taking it back and being late on returning anything that I rent or anything like that. So there's so many positive things about it too. Um, but the point of me telling you that is that things are always changing and we just have to figure out, are we going to adopt into it? Um, you know, we're going to, are we going to be the puck and be, be where, look where it's going and be a part of that? Or are we going to get stuck back? So these are the magic numbers. Again, I just want to show these every time so that you know them, know them, know them. Two, two, four, six. In a balanced market, in a good, in a good economy, we see GDP right around 2%, gross domestic product, by the way. Um, inflation right around 2%, which inflation uh, is at 9.1% right now, by the way. Um, real estate, we want to see an average appreciation of about 4%. Um, that's that's a balanced real estate market. And then unemployment, we want to see below 6%. If we can stay at these numbers, everything is usually pretty smooth and good. Um, when it's not is when we get out of whack. And that's kind of how we have been. Um, this actually, I didn't change this slide. This was the slide from last month where inflation was at 7%. And so just so you know, um, right now for year, year today or this month right now, today, live time, yesterday, live time, it was 9.1%. Um, so, um, another big reason of that too, and this is actually still the same, but there is still shutdown in China. Um, and just remember that an actual recession for like the, the definition of a recession is two quarters of negative GDP. Um, we did have Q1 was negative Q2. I don't know if they officially came out and said if it was negative or not, um, shoot guys, I should have looked that up for you. I will find that out and send it in the, in the post email. Um, I'm looking just to see if I had it in my notes and I don't remember, but they were predicting that by the end of Q3, we, the government would officially declare us to be in a recession. Um, okay. Thank you, Mike. Mike with the stats always for the win. I, it has not been released yet. Thank you. Perfect. So when it is, um, I'll let you guys know. So these are just the numbers that you need to know and understand. So um, I don't know if any of you attended this. I know a couple of you did that I see on, but I was on a Dave Ramsey reality check, um, like him or love him. Um, and I have mixed emotions sometimes too. <laughs> uh, he gave perspective and he gave some really great data. 
And it all actually matched exactly what Gary gave. I liked some of his graphs um, better. Honestly, I thought they were easier to understand from a consumer perspective that I think you guys could use too. So a couple of things that I just want to make sure that you are aware of, and then I'll show you some of the graphs. Um, so there's only one thing that drives houses um, up, okay? And that's demand. That should say house prices. Sorry, that is a typo. One thing that drives house prices up and that's demand. If you think about it, coming out of COVID, everybody wanted something bigger. They wanted something better. They wanted to be closer to their family. They didn't have to be next to their work anymore. They needed more room. They were pregnant and having babies or they decided they couldn't live with their spouse anymore and they were getting a divorce. I mean, COVID brought about so many different things. And what that did was it created a demand for more houses. In 2020, home prices were up 29%. In 2021, they were up 18%. They're projected this year to be up 8% and then go back to 3 to 4% in 2023, which is a balanced normal market. Remember um, what we just talked about, those magic numbers. Let me go back really fast. 2246. Real estate appreciation at around 4% is the magic number. That's kind of a balanced market. That is not a crash. So what we're really going to talk about today is, yes, we are going to go into a shift. Yes, we're going to feel a little downturn in the market. What we won't feel is a 2008, 2007, 2008 crash. And I've been saying that from the very first one of these that we did. Um, there's a massive difference between those two, but it, but we will, we will feel a slowdown, but it's, it's not a crash. So here's a couple of stats around that. Currently, um, the supply is half of what it was in 2007. So in 2007, there were approximately 3.7 million homes for sale compared to today, about 800,000. So there's not as many homes out there for it to be a crash, if that makes sense. Um, in 2006, there were 2.7 million new, um, new construction homes that were started compared to this year, last year and this year, around 1.3 million new build starts. So if you, were, if you were in the business in 07, 08, you might remember, I mean, it was a massive amount of new construction. Um, most economists will say that any builder that has a lot of spec inventory, um, may want to just watch it. They, you know, they, they could be concerned. We are having more price reductions right now than we've had in like, I think the last at least 72 months. In 2007, 2008, we had zero big companies and major organizations purchasing real estate. And today we have a ton. So this is going to drive demand also. This to me is very interesting. And I'm hearing it all over. They're buying in Indianapolis right now. They're buying in Columbus right now a lot. Um, and we've actually even had some come in and buy in Lexington, which has just been interesting to me, but it's actually creating more of a demand than we have the supply for. And I found this extremely interesting for those of you that are, that are on here in Columbus. Um, this is the percentage of homes bought by investors. So look at this in Atlanta, Georgia right now, 33% of the homes that are being bought are, are bought by an investor, meaning a bigger company or an organization um, are coming in. So these are the top 10 that they're buying in right now, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Charlotte, Phoenix, Miami, Las Vegas, Orlando, Tampa, Nashville has been huge. And look at Columbus, 22.8% of the homes this year that have been sold in Columbus, Ohio, have been bought by an investor, by a some sort of investment company or organization. Um, if you're in the ones on the right, <laughs> then you're you're in the bottom seven of where investors are looking to buy right now. Um, they're, they're not buying in Chicago, Virginia Beach, Minneapolis, Portland, Seattle, Washington, or Providence. So it's interesting because if you go back to look at this, when we had a crash in 07, 08, there were no big companies like that that were out buying as investments. We had local investors, but we didn't have huge companies that are coming in. Are they mostly out-of-state investors organized? Yes, Tyler, definitely they are. Um, we're going to see a lot more of that. I mean, we're going to see big conglomeration investment, billion dollar investment companies that are coming in that want to buy investments. And if and if you any of you that study the rental market, um, you might have noticed or you might be somewhat paying attention to the fact that rents, what's happening with rents right now? <laughs> They're like through the roof. Yeah, they it is outrageous to rent right now. So these investors are seeing that and they're like, man, why would we not buy as many rentals as we can? Because the rental, the rental prices are just continuing to go up and up and up. 
Um, this, I found this really, I'm going to explain this, but I found this really interesting. So when you have supply versus demand, I think we all know what that means. However, I like how he broke this down. Supply is we have a shortage of used inventory, home starts are down, and foreclosures have been down. Demand, we have 5 million more millennial buyers this year. We have 12 million more overall households, and we have investors buying one in four homes. So the demand is what's creating this. And honestly, you know, I found it interesting, um, especially where I live in two states, but operate in like five states. <laughs> um, I They're all different. And right now, and if people have been asking me this about the Charleston, South Carolina market, because, you know, I have, we have a house here and we live here half the time I do. And um, I don't, I don't anticipate them going down. Honestly, I really don't. And, and Dave Ramsey actually said that in some of these areas, it would be like saying, you know, if any of you can are familiar with Florida, like the Florida market, I mean, 20 years ago, you could buy a house in Naples on the beach for half a million dollars. I mean, now you're not getting anything less than 10 million. The, the demand has gone up so much so that the prices have never come down. They've just continued to appreciate and appreciate because the demand has been there. And I'm going to show you a graph here in a minute that's going to blow your mind on that. But here's a little bit more data that you should know and understand when it comes to new construction, so if you think about it, in 2006, 2007, um, the average lumber prices were $630 per 100 board foot. And uh, in 2000, I should say 20 and 21, they went to $1,750. So lumber more than doubled, which I know a lot of you are familiar with. But that affected new build starts. Um, it also affected the price of new construction, right? Because builders aren't going to take a loss on that. Foreclosures in 2007, 2008, when we had the crash, quotation marks, um, they were between 500 and 600,000 foreclosures that came up. And today we have absolutely none. Many economists, including Gary Keller, including Dave Ramsey, including um, Steve Murray from Real Trends, they believe that we will see foreclosures coming back in. And that's because there's a big stack from bankruptcies. And that means that foreclosures and bankruptcies, I mean, they go together, right? So if we, because there are some that need to be cleared out, we will see foreclosures, we will see some foreclosures, but it'll be nothing like it was before. We will not hit the 500, 600,000. I mean, I can't, I guess never say never, but the, the, the data is not there to, to prove that. And remember, a short sell is when people are upside down. That's not necessarily as much the case right now. Foreclosures, foreclosures are when you can't afford the payment, but you might have equity in your house. And I think that's more of what we will see because as inflation continues to go up, people are paying more for gas, more for groceries, more for just the cost of living is expensive. And that takes away from them being able to afford their mortgage payment. However, they may have some great equity in their house. They might just not be able to access it. So that's actually what will typically push people into foreclosure. And then we'll have the backlog. We still had, oh man, I think I had this on the last one. I don't remember. Oh shoot, I don't have that notebook in front of me, but I can't remember how many people, um, too many numbers in my head and I have a cold brain fog right now, but how many people didn't go back to work? Some of you may, somebody may remember it after the pandemic. Well, remember a lot of those people still have a mortgage and they still have bills to pay. <laughs> so that's what could cause in, it ca could cause some of these into foreclosure. Um, prime home buyers right now um, are in their mid thirties. So millennials are the absolute target home buyer. They are the prime home buyer. They will continue to be for probably the next 12 to 36 months, um, which, is, um, which is just something really good for you to know. Um, let's see what Brian, oh, Brian Wentz, you're on. I love Brian. Underwater homes in 06 were at 7% and surged to 26%. Wow. In Q3 of 2009. Today, underwater homes just below 2%. Thank you. Love it. Love a good stat. And so you can see there's a huge difference, right? Between what going into a shift versus a crash could look like. Um, this is this next bullet point, I think was just really good to touch on. And I've been sharing this with a lot of our agents <clears throat> in my market centers. Um, a lot of buyers over the last two years felt like that they were boxed out of the market, meaning they didn't have cash to cover appraisal gaps or they didn't have cash to pay cash when they were bidding against cash. Um, <clears throat> they, um, they, were, they were more chasing the, the houses and they, they, they felt like they got boxed out, right? So that's going to shift. Um, actually, the rates going up, honestly, will help a little bit with that. But if you had buyers in the last two years that they got burnt out or they didn't have the cash or whatever that is, those are the ones that you guys should be going back to. 
because this will actually help them. It'll give them an opportunity to not be boxed out of the market. It'll give them an opportunity to come back into the market. Um, and so that's where we talk about it will shift and slow down, but not like 2008. The data is just not there. So what Dave's prediction was, which I, I agree with, and this is what Gary has said, we will likely shift into a normal for sellers market, a great for buyers market, um, even more than a year ago, for those reasons that I just said, the buyers will actually be able to compete now. And it's still going to be a normal market for sellers. Now, they might not be getting, you know, $200,000 over ask price and get to stay in their home for 12 months for free and, you know, a vacation. I mean, I've heard some of the craziest crap, you guys, <laughs> that sellers were offered over the last two years. It blows my mind. Um, but again, that's not normal. That's not a normal seller's market. So we will shift back into probably a normal seller's market, which will mean for most of you, you need to dust back up or if you have dust off, I mean, or if you haven't before, if you've never had one before, your listing presentations, your objections on how to do price reductions. I talked with um, one of our agents in Columbus yesterday, Teresa Kinney, and she said, I'm staging like everything and I'm still getting above list price with the staging. And I thought, man, like we used to stage everything. And over the last couple of years, I mean, we personally, I don't think we've staged anything. Um, and so getting back to those things, I think is going to be really, really important. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a good graph that just shows you um, how of the more prime home buyers right now. So you can look back in 2008. Um, we had generation X, um, we're at 55 million. So if you look right here, that's about three and a half million where today millennials, um, we're, uh, we're up over the 4 million mark. So there's about a $5 million, $5, 5 million, um, dollar, 5 million person difference between now today where millennials are buying. So this is going to drive up the demand even more. Um, I think I've been reading my coach and I love, um, Terry and I love, we heard this guy speak, Tim Elmore, and he writes a lot about generations and he's written a ton of good books, but I actually thought this week after she's doing a study with him right now. And I thought after my call with her, I thought, man, I need to bust back out and read. I, th I mean, I think I am a millennial. I think I'm on the year where I'm like right there. I don't know. I can't remember. 83 is when I was born. If anybody knows that. Um, but uh, but I, I felt like, like I needed to tell everybody that they probably need to really study on millennials because if there's 5 million of them out there and they're our prime home buyer right now, we really need to understand that elder millennial Tyler. Oh man. <laughs> Thanks for the term. <laughs> Is that technically what I am? I think so. He's typing. Yes. It really is, Brittany said. Oh, man. Okay, Brittany is too. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We're Okay, yep. Okay, so we're an elder millennial. Good to know. Learn something new every single day. And I just said, I, this was the year that I actually kind of started to feel older. Um, can you go back to the last screen real quick? Yes, I can, Jess. There you go. Um, so anyway, if you're not, okay, thanks, Susan. We have a lot of millennials on. If you're not a millennial, you should, you should understand millennials and their buying habits and what they're into. How do they like to communicate? Um, do they prefer tech more? Do they not prefer tech more? Do they prefer, prefer more face-to-face? -face? Um, it just made me think about that. And you're welcome. Made me think about that and understanding that a little bit better. I stole this slide straight yesterday from Chris Welton um, on Troy Marsh's Zoom. So if you were on, this is a repeat. And if you weren't, I loved this because what this tells you is that home prices have not been affected. If anything, they have continued to go up. So if you look at October 2015, housing today, a bubble larger than 2006. Appreciation was at 5%, so a little above normal. Um, and so you say you had an average home price of, that was started at 300, it went to 315. August 2016, we're in a new housing bubble, appreciation at 5.4%. Your house went to 332. In 2017, homeownership doesn't build wealth studies find. Appreciation was at 6%. There, your home was now at 353. In 2018, it's better to rent than to buy in today's housing market is what the headline was. Appreciation was at 4%, which is normal. So now your home was worth 367. So just three years later, 67,000 more in equity. 2019, the housing market is about to shift in a bad way for buyers. Appreciation was still at 4%. So your home then was worth 382. 2000, December 2019, just, just what, five, six months later, 
Next year will be hard on the housing market, especially in big cities, but appreciation went to 16%. So now your home was worth 443. And in July of 2021, housing boom is over as new home sales fall to pandemic low. However, in 2021, we still had 18% appreciation. And this same person's home, if they bought it into if they if it was worth 300 in 2015, in July of 2021 was worth 523 or is worth 523. So the thing that I absolutely loved about this. Okay, did Abby say geriatric millennials is all that I need to know? Who who said who from the one D? It definitely was probably Abby because she's the one on a consistent basis that makes me feel old these days. It was her. Yes. Thank you, Abby. Perfect. You and TT are both in timeout. <laughs> um, so the, the perfect thing about this is that we really, this tells us one, we can't believe fake news. That's why we have to have perspective. And that's why we have to have the data and the stats and the things that I share with you guys that I want you to continue to understand about. Um, but this is, this is nuts. I mean, who in the world, whoever said, uh, who, which one was it? Home ownership doesn't build wealth. Studies fine. I mean, this person at two hundred twenty three thousand dollars of wealth uh, in a six year time period, in my opinion, is pretty dang good. Um, and I would have loved to have seen what their stock portfolio looked like during that time as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna almost bet that this is a little bit better. So the next part of this to me was also equally as interesting. And that's our domestic migration. We have, I didn't know this. I mean, I knew this, but I didn't know it like this. Um, and I found this to be fascinating. Homeowners have been leaving certain states and running to other states in a massive way. And some of you may feel that in Charleston, we felt that a ton in Columbus. That's happening a lot. People are coming from California, New York. Well, you're going to see on the next slide. The reasons that they're doing that are mainly for a couple of key reasons. One, they're running to lower tax states. Um, two, people moved for more health freedom. I mean, when, when New York was completely shut down, we had an influx of people in Charleston that bought. Adam and I lost a, a house that we loved. I like our house now better, so everything works out for a reason, but I was like super upset about it <laughs> to somebody who came in and bought cash, um, cash sight unseen from New York because they were sick and tired of not being able to do the things that they wanted to do. And, and in South Carolina, we didn't have as harsh of, um, COVID restrictions as what they did in New York. So more health freedom states, um, different politics and political views are making people move. And all of this affects housing prices to the positive in the states that they're moving into, maybe not the states that they're moving out of, which is just a couple, and I'll show those to you. But the states that they're moving out of already had such high pricing for homes anyway, that now they can move to somewhere like the Midwest and they can have a larger house with more land and a you know maybe better school or equally school district and all those all those things but at a lower price and they still feel like it's a win. So that's going to continue to drive up the demand. The largest frustration from 2019 today this was a Ramsey study that they did and I thought this was so true and you guys can probably relate is how much more expensive it is. Um, but he did say one could argue it's a better time to buy because of what we said earlier. You don't have to pay cash and um, we're getting back to not having to, you know, waive inspections, which I think is like the dumbest thing on the planet. Um, but, you know, all those things that that buyers were doing just to win offers, that's that those will go away in a normal market. Here's the domestic migration um, slide that came from Dave Ramsey. It, they brought they got it from the Census Bureau. So you could also find it on there. But if you look at this, 888,000 homeowners moved out of the states. For, this is from July of 2020 to current. So basically in the last two years, almost a million people moved out of California, Illinois, New York. And I, I have a really hard time saying that M state for some reason. And we were just talking about this with the kids and it gave them the opportunity in the car. We were talking about this and Adam, we were cracking up because they I, I was pronouncing it wrong. And they kept saying Massachusetts. And I was like, okay, you don't get the opportunity to use this to try to say a cuss word because I'm saying the state wrong. <laughs> so now every time I see that, it makes me laugh. And I think about that. I'm like, oh my gosh, these kids. Um, but so almost a million people moved out of those states. 
And they moved into states like Arizona, Texas, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida. Um, and amongst many others, those were just the top six, I believe. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So you can see most of them are lower tax states. I mean, Florida, Tennessee being probably, I think, maybe the main two. Um, Texas might be too. I'm not 100% sure. But this will continue to change as the migration changes. And it's going to definitely affect <clears throat> demand and it's going to affect the prices too. So interest rates, I, I, I put this in here because I think it's so true. I feel like they've become a trigger word again. It's like people hear interest rates and they're like, ah, triggered by it. Um, <clears throat> but the thing that Dave said is interest rates don't cause prices to go up or down. And I have some slides to show you this. And Jen Vickers, please let me know if one of these is the slide you're looking, slide you're looking for because I looked through mine and I wasn't sure which one you wanted. 1978 rates went above 10% for the first time ever. In 1981, they were at 18%. That was when Gary Keller sold his first house. Um, they still sold houses then. Dave Ramsey shared that he sold 78 homes himself in 1985, and the interest rate was 14%. In 1992, they finally went below 10%. Again, so from 1978 to 1992, they were above 10%. That's kind of a long time frame if you think about it. And people still bought and sold. Um, and then um, and then they never been back up since then. So 1992 was the last time that they were at 10%. Now, people are saying they feel like by the end of this year, they could get to eight. I mean, Gary originally was saying, don't be shocked if you see 10. Um, I think most people, that was at the beginning of the year. I think most people now are saying that, you know, they, they could, although the last couple of weeks, I think they went back down. Um, and I'm going to have somebody next month on to talk a little bit more about rates too. But he said the spike in rates is causing the emotion and the fear. And what we really need to do as the expert, which is all of us, is give our client the perspective that they need, because what they hear on the news is the trout pick. <laughs> so I want you to think about that. Um, and that's why I dug out that old picture to show you guys, because that's what our clients, that's their perspective. I mean, what they hear on the news is that the rates are through the roof and that they can't afford a house. But what they need from us as their expert, as their realtor, um, is we, we need to give them perspective on those things. And I think it's great. Like Jen Vickers, I love tonight. She's having a seller seminar and she asked me for some of these slides because she's going to show. And I think that's so good, Jen. That's like one of the smartest things you can do because that's giving them the perspective that they need based on data and stats, not based on something that they see, you know, on Facebook. Um, this might be what you're looking for, Jen. Here's a fixed rate mortgage average versus medium home price. So the interesting thing about this slide, um, and this was this came from Dave Ramsey, but it looks like he sourced at the bottom where he got it from too. But you can look. So the blue squiggly um, lines uh, represent the interest rate at the time, the percentage of the interest rate. And then as you can see, this is the price of the homes. So it's interesting to me to really actually watch through this. Um, Caroline, yes, we will... We will send out the slides for you guys. Just make sure you source Dave Ramsey if you use them, <laughs> not me. Um, but you can see the correlation is interesting because the, the rates really, I mean, you can see they, I mean, they, you, exactly the numbers from 1992 all the way back down. They've never, they never went back above 10. However, the medium home price has continued. It took a little dip right there, but they've just continued, it's continued to go up and up and up and up. Um, so it doesn't look like it's a, uh, Oh, they don't go out with a recording. Okay, um, thank you. I will make sure that we do send the slides with the recording. And if you need them from last time, um, just shoot me an email. It's it's um, here. It's Dana Gentry at kw.com, and you got and we'll make sure that we get them sent to you. Um, here's also the mortgage rates and this a different one. This one came from KW uh, research team. This is one Gary shared with us, but this is just annually if you like to look at it in a different way. I tend to like to look at it in this kind of bar graph way versus those squiggly lines. Um, but you can see the averages and uh, the average 30 year fixed um, mortgage rate too. And then it gives you the historic as well for any of you that, that like those. And then in case you're like a numbers visual person, <laughs> here are the rates um, and for every single year uh, back since 1972 um, through 2021. And I think that the average average ended up being right around six, I, I think, out of all of these. 
Um, I had that in a note. I'm pretty sure it was six something, as you can see. So they've really, the, 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 um, the end message on this part is we've just been so spoiled the last couple of years, really. And we just need to give our clients the perspective around this because it's, we've never had anything like what we've had in, in the last three to four years uh, <clears throat> compared to the historical average. <coughs> I stole this from Troy Marsh too. Um, if any of you want to take this and use it, I would, I think this would be awesome to use in your buyer presentations or make sure that you're sending something like this out, even an email to your clients. But this is just the difference in the rates in their monthly payments. So you can just see on a 300, 400, 500, $600,000 loan amount at a 3.25% rate what their PI, remember that's just PI, um, not taxes and insurance, just principal and interest. But the difference between a 3.25 and a 5.85 and the difference in their monthly payment. So, I mean, if you're buying a $600,000 house, I mean, that's $1,000 a month different on your, or almost 928 on your monthly payment. And these are just the things, this is just giving them the reality so that they can make a sound um, decision and understand the facts. <clears throat> so I, this next one, I took this from, um, this was a screenshot of Gary's, Gary Keller's last mastermind with Jay and Jason. And I think I shared this, but I wanted to re-hit it again because this is where Gary believes the opportunity is. And this is this worksheet on the right-hand side. For agents, he really believes in two things. For your business, the opportunity is to get back to the fundamentals, really understanding leads, listings, and leverage. Um, I love to ask this. And so I would love it again. Will you just type yes or no if you had your license in 2007, 2008? Um, so meaning if you went through every session before or a shift, yes or no. Um, and no, if you have not, yep, I figured most couple yeses, um, mostly, mostly no's. Um, so this is, this is good for you to, to look at, especially if you said no, or even if you said yes, because it's been a while, right? But most of us, what most of you were not in the business in 2007, 2008. So you do need to get back to the fundamentals and understanding leads, listings, and leverage. Um, you need to be prescriptive with your clients, meaning you need to give them the data and the numbers. You need to give them the stats. You need to give them exactly the prescription. Think about it. If you're going to the doctor, they don't just describe what will actually make you feel better. They give you the exact prescription for what it is that you need to, um, to not be sick anymore. And so you need to figure out what that looks like for your clients and how you communicate that to them. Because giving them prescriptions and being prescriptive with it is going to keep you, it's, it's going to make you their expert, right? They're going to continue to look at you as the expert. If you're growing a team, he believes the opportunity is to continue to add more agents so that you can have more leverage. Um, you need to convert more of your leads. Gary definitely believes that we don't, and I, I totally agree with this, that we don't actually have a lead problem. We have a follow-up problem. Many of us have so many old leads. Um, we just we let them go. And remember that the time that they are most likely to convert is after the seventh or eighth touch. If it's a cold lead, not, not somebody from like your, you know, your sphere or a past client, um, but a cold lead actually converts on the seventh or eighth time. And I would challenge you guys to ask yourself the question, how many uh, leads or contacts do you have in your CRM or in your database somewhere that you haven't touched in who knows how long? And did you touch them seven or eight times? Um, and probably not. And then just running your running your business like a business, running departments like a business. So having a leads and appointment part of your business, having a sales and listings department in your business, and then having listing, marketing, and transaction management. Um, that's why we've been bringing that stuff into our market centers to just be leveraged for you guys, like use the transaction management company, help, let us help you do your marketing so that you can leverage those things and run them like a business. And then investing in yourself, Gary Billy, or investing with your wealth in, in your own personal wealth is another big opportunity going into a shift. Um, he says, associate yourself with cash, um, understand rates of return. Um, it, it actually blew my mind. I heard a stat about a certain number of people. I don't remember what it was, but it was high that, um, have never had, like, didn't even know hard money loans existed, but, um, you should associate yourself with, with at least understanding hard money loans. Um, and then of course, understanding the rates of return for your business and just following a model. Um, Gary's motto has always been what I've tried to live by, which is for every dollar you spend on your business, you should get four back from that. And I think that's just a good, safe, easy way to look at it. 
um, and, and to track what it is that you're spending because I, Linda and I and Terry talked about this on last week, but I do get somewhat irritated when people hear shift and recession and they're like, bah, I'm cutting everything. I'm moving out of the office. I'm firing my coach. I'm stopping my direct mailing and all those things. And I'm like, wait a minute. There, do you even know if you're making money on those things? Because you should ne- the, the absolute rule of thumb, you should never cut anything that's making you money um, or making you be more productive or that you're getting a good ROI on. But you're not going to know that if you're not watching your ROI and you don't know what you're what you're getting. Um, and so this last part, I really, how am I doing on time? And I don't know, it's said two 30, but I've been keeping these at an hour. So we should be done right at two. Um, this is a little, this is a different change of pace. So I gave you the stats and gave you good perspective and good data, but I just want you to think about the future of real estate and, and who decides what the future is. Um, many, many smart people in the real estate industry and economists and brokerage owners and large team owners would challenge us to think about the agent relationship really switching from being transactional to home ownership. It's over the last several years, Gary talked about this. It's like the brokerages used to have all the power. It was like you joined a great brokerage. The brokerage had the branding. The brokerage kind of had the power. It was more that traditional old school way of thinking. And then over the last few years, it kind of switched to where agents had more of the power. Agents were building teams bigger than what their office even was like, or agents were really coming up with ways to Um, innovate and change and bring more value and do all of those things. A lot of people, again, and I've been studying this a ton and I'm going to bring you guys more on this, but they believe that the next shift of power is moving to the homeowners. And, and there's a, there is data that, that shows that. And there's just a lot of, um, I mean, for one, the fact that we do like use this for everything, um, whether you're a geriatric millennial or not, I think you're still using your phone for everything. So it, people, they expect more, they expect a different experience. They, they expect more from us. And so what I mean by, hi, Tim Real. Oh my gosh, long time no see. What I mean by moving from transactional to homeownership is you aren't, they aren't looking for you to just help them with the transaction. Um, And some of you who've done this for a long time, you'll understand this. Like when you sell a house to somebody, you're who they, who they call when they need a painter, when their garbage disposal is broken, um, you know, when their HVAC leaks, all the things, right? When they need somebody to mow their grass and they don't know anybody, you become all the things. And this is moving even more towards a different shift now where they're looking to you for all, all the things home ownership wise. So I want you to start thinking about that. And this is what this looks like. Um, we have consumer services, agent services, broker services, and core services. And then that moves down to the agent, which then moves down to the consumer. All of those are going to be different. But the main thing on the consumer services for you guys to be thinking about are what are some of those things that remember this sentence I've shared with many of you before. And if you've never heard it, you need to write this down because you're a client of mine blank. And that's what I'm I know Stephanie's heard that. I know what I'm talking about with that is because you're a client of mine you have access to a free window cleaning every single year. Because you're a client of mine, you get unique access to our private Fall Fest event, you know, to hear Tiffany Laverne's husband sing, hopefully, if you're in the Kentucky office. Um, you know, what are those things that you are that you are giving your clients unique access to um, and unique insights to and unique services for because they are a client of yours? So one of the things I just really want you guys to think about as our industry changes is what's the answer to that? Like, number one, do you even have an answer? And number two, if you don't, you need to. And if you do, like, how can you continue to expand on that? And I mean, we need to do the same thing for our team. We've been doing that. But because they're a client of yours, blank. And what is that? Because they need to see you as the everything, honestly. And that can feel a little you know, under pressure. Um, But the reality is that it's the truth because we don't want big corporations coming and talking them into not using a real estate agent for their transaction. We don't want them to think that they can list their house with Redfin, um, you know, or bundle with Zillow and and all those things. We we want them to keep you at the at the belly to belly relationship level with them. And the way to do that is to constantly be their Toma top of mind awareness and to be able to be the homeownership everything. It's not just transactional anymore. You need to know when their kid loses a tooth. You need to know when their son passes their driving you know, exam. 
Um, you need to know how much equity they have in their house and help them maybe understand that they could take, just like I asked Troy yesterday, they could take that money and go make money. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of people that have the opportunity to do that right now because they have more equity than they've ever had. Um, you need to know, you know, when they lose a loved one or, um, all the things like you need, you need to be the everything <laughs> and that that's home ownership. And, and I do believe that with the right kind of leverage, you can do that and you can be that. But I think we just can't forget that because as the market shifts, we've got to do that. So, um, a couple of things just to wrap up. Um, I pay to subscribe to a platform called thousand watt. Um, it's not cheap to be honest. So I try to share some of it that I can with you guys. Cause it can be, it can be pricey, but I do get a lot of good data from them. And I just want to have you think about this, um, that, that, that their founder and owner wrote in the email to the, to the, to the people, whatever we are subscribers this last month. And he was talking about consumers have had a taste of real change in the past decade. So I just want, <clears throat> want you to read this. It's like three slides, but it's good. On May 14th, 2007, at the end of the previous party, Redfin CEO Glenn was featured in a 60 minute piece titled 6% in which he said real estate by far is the most screwed up industry in America. It ignited a firestorm and put Redfin on the map. Many of you actually, if you were in the business then, I was, remember that. Less than two weeks later, on May 27, 2007, the Department of Justice announced that it had settled its lawsuit against NAR um, over rules that impeded discount brokers claiming the resolution would result in more choices, better services, and lower commission rates for consumers. Of course, no such thing happened over the next five years. Housing came down hard and commissions rose, actually. So some people were paying more than 6%, and they as they typically do in a buyer's market. As of Q1 2022, 15 years later, Redfin's national market share stood at 1.18%. Uh, by volume. And Realtrends estimates that all discount shops have never topped three to 4% market share. Um, that's an important number. A handful of flat fee or rebate companies like Homey have gained traction locally or regionally in the past few years, but many others, perhaps most notably Purple Bricks, which many of you have heard of, um, they fail. He said, but it feels to me like the stage is set a bit differently this time. The force of change seems at once more diffused and more impactful and rooted more firmly in felt consumer needs. So see, again, it's going back to the consumer. This started in 2015 with the launch of Open Door, which introduced an entirely new way to sell a house that did not simply adjust the terms of the existing structure, but circumvented it altogether. This provoked Zillow to go all in on the Open Door model to the extent that which Rich Barton said in 2019, I remember when he said this, I actually shared this on a Zoom, ideally I would like to have the Zestimate be a live offer for every house in the country. How much of a joke is that, by the way? Sorry, Rich Barton. And the company began making that real uh, for some homes in 2021, you kind of thought that the jig was up. The Zillow moonshot was aborted, but Open Door and OfferPad remain, as does the educational imprint left by the most far reaching real estate brand on the planet, touting this model for four years. Um, the toothpaste is out of the tube. Some people can now move more quickly and easily and will choose this path. And really, that's reality, meaning that a non trivial number of homes will no longer be sold within the traditional system. Open Door also embraced I buying's. Uh, can, can, I don't even know how to say that, whatever that means. Power buying, like I buying, uh, power buying deploys capital or assumes risk in order to surmount hurdles in the traditional transaction process. Many smart people I talk to think that the cash or good as cash offers power buyers enable will be op operative in half of all transactions in the coming years. That's really important, you guys. <laughs> um, the fact that that could happen and be half of transactions, that's, that's important. Some power buyers, open door included, employ their own agents, which I have referred to as push button agents, he says, while others notably like Homeward, which many of you know Homeward, Knock and Ribbon, allow buyers to work with their own agent. To the extent that the former succeed, more and more people will experience a very different kind of real estate agent. And so I shared that with you because I just want you to think about that. As we move into a recession and a shift, it's not necessarily just the home prices or the rates or those things that are going to change. 
it it's 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 the industry as a whole really to be honest and so that's why so much of this is so important and i just like i'm so proud of everybody that gets on and listens and you guys should share these with other realtors that you care about because honestly it it's it's a different industry and things move very very differently <clears throat> and if there's a chance that i don't believe this but if there's a chance that half of the home sold could be sold in some sort of open door i buying uh way or transaction method um, that's a lot less homes for real store, for realtors to sell or be a part of the transaction of. So it's all the more reason why we have to really, really, really be in relationship with our people. So in closing, a couple of quick things. Um, number one, a shift does not mean you are so welcome, Cody. Thank you for being on. A shift does not mean a crash. I do believe we are, I believe we're already in a shift. I mean, many of you are feeling it. Do you guys feel like we are? Am I the only one that feels like that? It's definitely already feeling that way. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're going to crash like 0708. You must know the skills necessary to navigate a shifting market to get to gain market share, to be able to go out and take market share. Um, uh, you need to think of yourself as less transactional and more homeownership, which is what we just talked about, meaning that you're their everything. When it comes to your clients, you have to be the expert um, and you have to be the one who's in constant communication and relationship with them. And I just gave some examples, but you have to think of Terry Moyler's letter from the heart. And if you missed that, um, you should have gotten an email last night with it. And it was great the episode for on, on shift with Linda and Terry. They have just like wealth of knowledge. Um, but Terry sends a letter from the heart to her clients every month. I think it's so smart. Or you might think of Danny Barron in Cincinnati, his his Danny parties or Ken Posek's community on YouTube. Or honestly, I'm throwing Roger Wilcut now into this mix of dominating where he lives. Um, but you have to be known for something. And it's more important than ever before for you to figure out what that is. And you have to really, 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 you've got to be known for something. Um, and so I just want to challenge you to think about that. So here's my three pieces of advice and action items for you today. Number one, you need to know your sales stats. You need to know your markets and you need to be familiar with our nations. I mean, you need, you should be familiar enough that you can logically um, explain because not just rattle it off to your clients because they have no clue what it means either. You should be able to at least somewhat break it down for them. And this doesn't, this stuff doesn't come naturally for me. So I'm sure it probably doesn't for many of you, you either, but I just have to keep doing it over and over and over. But one thing I can promise you is that if you go teach it, you will learn it. Um, that doing this every month has forced me to, and I needed that. And I, I, I love that. Um, and if you just go, that's why I'm so happy of Jen Vickers doing this with her sellers tonight. And if any of you else are doing things like that, let me know. Cause I would love to hear. Um, what you're doing. But if you just commit to go teach it, like you're going to learn it, I promise. Um, and that's such a good way of doing it, but you should be familiar with those. Um, the second thing that I think you need to do, and some of you are going to hate me for this, but you have got to adopt to video. Um, you have to. Tyler's going to love me for this, but everybody else is going to hate me for this. But you need to, you've got to get on the video train. I'm just telling you, I know many of you are, and I think that's great. There is so much market share to be taken. The people who are visible, who are out there, who um, just remember perception is reality. <laughs> so um, go out and, and, Follow uh, Euler Hines, my friend Scott Euler from Cincinnati. I mean, just freaking, they crush it, honestly. I mean, so, so, so good. Um, many of you know Ken. Ken's on our panel next month, and this is, or next week, I'm sorry, next week. And this is exactly what he's going to be talking about. Um, when is that panel? Shoot, I don't have it in front of me. Abby might know it, but um, follow Ken. Um, I don't like super love to do these either, but I don't hate them, but I've gotten a lot better at doing them and and I'm getting traction from them a lot. So you have to be okay with, with doing video and, and, and getting in front of a camera and many of you are not, but, but you have to. Um, Tyler, if you have any tips for that, you might want to put them in the chat. And then number three thing that I would say that you do, oh, Tech Tuesday is up next. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> certain video editor that you like. Oh gosh, Susan, I don't know. I Tyler is my everything. So I'm, I have no clue how to answer that because Tyler's the best editor that I know. <laughs> but um, but we can we can probably help get you some more information on that. Uh, there you go. That's true. Get a ring light and you'll be ahead of the curve. Yes. Um, and so here's the last thing you can do. And we will send you this uh, this worksheet. 
but <clears throat> you need to you need to know your top four lead generation sources and you really need to know them for the second half of the year um, if you don't already many of you track these but I would this is the the purpose of this exercise is to list all your lead generation sources for the last 12 months prioritize your first list in order of most leads generated. So, I mean, you might have open houses, online leads, Facebook, social media, sphere of influence, client events, database, referrals, repeat. You might have a lender partner, you know, whoever, whatever all your list is. Then prioritize them. Sorry, Jen, I'm hurrying for who got, where'd you get the most leads from? And then you need to record the four main areas of focus for your lead gen. And then that needs to be where you need to just bust it out. Honestly, the, those four sources they need to know you like the back of their hand. Um, thank you. It's July 26th is the big panel. Yes. At 1 p.m. It's going to be awesome. Um, they're each giving a 10 minute hack on how they make a, a tip that can make you a million dollars, like real life tactical um, how it's done for them. So we'll send this out to you. And then, oh, there it is. I had it in here. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> okay. So that's Tuesday, the 26th. Um, you can register for that. Would love to have you guys on and show them some support, which would be great. Plus it's going to be freaking awesome. Um, Abby put the link in the chat for you to register. And then I just want to leave you with this. Oh, Tyler, that's so nice. You can DM Tyler on Instagram if you have questions too. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I'm a fan of Tom Ferry and sometimes I'm not, but I am a fan of this. The market sh the market's shifted. Make your calls, talk to your clients, meet new ones, identify problems, solve problems, rent and repeat. Don't ask for things to improve. Just go get better. This is the time the best take market share. And that is very, very, very true. So two minutes late. Thank you guys for being on. Um, I know we're over. So if you have any questions, just shoot me an email or message or text or something. Um, but hopefully you found value today. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. See you guys. <coughs> Do you want to just make me cut a uh, host?